Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming to this solar energy workshop put on by Armitage Neighborhood Association's Green Team in partnership with Minnesota Renewable Energy Society. Um, so as people trickle in, please just type in the chat window um, a quick introduction, who you are, what neighborhood you're from, um, and then uh, we'll just kind of go around and, and introduce ourselves. So I'm Sarah Komorowski. I live in Armitage neighborhood and I'm on the green team. Um, and there's a couple other green team members here, including my husband, Ethan, um, and I see Tara Carson and Linda as well. Um, and then I'm gonna let Lauren introduce herself too. Oh, that's really sweet. Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren Anderson, the coordinator for Armitage, and so happy to be here for this great workshop organized by the Green Team and, and MRES. We're glad you're here. I'm Mark Weber with Minnesota Renewable Energy Society. Um, so I've had solar in my house since 2011. I'm Doug Shoemaker with uh, MRES and uh, been involved for about 15 years with them. Um, and uh, just, uh, you know, kind of Mark's little helper. <laughs> That's my line. <laughs> I thought so, I'd steal his line. <laughs> I see a lot of Armitage people here. This is awesome. Um, good to see everyone. Oh, and Kenny, just our next door neighbors. Good, good, good. Um, well, I think it's 7.04. I want to just hand it right over so we have plenty of time. Um, Mark is going to share his screen and get right into it. Um, and then if you guys have questions, please feel free to type them into the chat and I will do my best to monitor and bring those up um, throughout the presentation. And um, if we don't get to something, we'll have time at the end for more questions too. So um, with that, Mark and Doug, take it away. Uh, now, what do you see on your screen? Do you see the presentation? Not yet. Bummer. I see a bunch of friendly faces. Okay, let's try again. Share screen. There we go. Share. There we go. It's waiting. Let's see. Slideshow. Here we go. From beginning. Now, what do you see? You see this? Now I see it. Yes, it looks perfect, Mark. Cool. Well, thanks for inviting MRES to the Armitage neighborhood meeting. Um, we're really happy to be here. So. I hope we'll have a good time. So what we're going to talk about today is, you know, what is renewable energy? And my favorite part is the history of photovoltaics. And then how does photovoltaics work? And then um, creating an electric current and then the components used in your photovoltaic system. And since I think all of you are Excel customers, we just focus the rest of the presentation on what you could get with Excel if you don't go and put solar on your house. So the Minnesota Renewable Energy Society is a all volunteer 501c3 organization that was started in 1978. Our mission is to advance a sustainable society and a renewable energy economy through education, leadership and example. Um, I'd be willing to bet that most of you, if you've run across us, um, ran across us at the Eco Experience at the State Fair. Um, I know Linda's always been a good volunteer out there for that. And um, so if you'd like to volunteer for that, not this year, but maybe next year, um, you'd have a lot of fun. This year, the State Fair is going to try and minimize the number of people in the buildings. So it'll be quite a bit smaller. So what is renewable energy? Um, right now, so in 2018, I really like this slide and I haven't seen, the, not the slide, but this um, picture. And um, in 2018, renewable energy was about 11% of the energy used in the United States. So you can see petroleum is about 36% and, you know, for liquid fuels, 
coal is about 13%. Um, solar and wind, um, 27%, maybe 28% now, but that's, that's growing and coal's going down. So like I said, that's us, that 11%-ish. Now, what you can't see, maybe I, I move the participant window over. So this chart is put out by the National um, Renewable Energy Lab. And the darker it is along the south is the more intensity of the sun. So you know, we got Minnesota up here and we're, we're kind of light. And then down here, you know, it's much darker. And so the normal irradiance in Minneapolis is about 4.1 kilowatt hours, meter squared per day. And um, in Yuma, it's about 7.3 kilowatt hours. So, you know, people will look at a chart like that and they'll say, why would you put solar panels up here? But believe it or not, we do just as well as these guys down here. And if you think about it, you know, they're very dry. So everything's dusty. So their solar panels are coated with dust all the time. And so the sun can actually get to the cells like up here, you know, since everything's so much more wet. You know, our panels are cleaned off every time it rains. And it's so our panels are um, receiving just as much sunshine as the guys down here in Arizona and New Mexico. If you ever want to uh, really kind of play with this, um, the National Renewable Energy Lab does have a really nice program called PV Watts. So if you kind of look up PV Watts and the National Renewable Energy Lab, you know, you can spend days and days occupying yourself playing with different ways to put solar in your house. So in Minnesota, the best roof you can have for solar is like a 10, 12 pitch. And so that's like a 40 degree roof. It's like 39.8 or something like that. But you would get that from playing with the PV Watts calculator. So if you were building a new house, ask for a 10, 12 pitch house. Um, you know, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Mine's an 8, 12 pitch. So, but if you want to just to find the um, optimum. So the University of Minnesota has a nice program that's a tad out of date. The Department of Commerce keeps saying they should throw some money at it to bring it back up to date. But photovoltaics is a seasonal resource. So in the summer, um, you know, you have a sun that's in the sky about 68 degrees. Um, and so you're getting much more sunlight on your panel. So you'll see that if you were to take the, um, the uh, LIDAR, LIDAR program from the University of Minnesota, you could look up your house with about two-year-old data, and you'd see how much solar you could expect to generate um, on each surface of your house per month. So, and as you can see in the summer months, it's quite a bit more in the winter months when um, the sun's like 21 degrees in the sky, so 28, 21 versus 20, 68 degrees, you get much less generation out of your system. But, and then here's my house. You can just kind of see it's kind of spiky, you know, over the years. And it's just, that's just the way solar works. Um, on my house right now, I generate about 121% of my need with 24 old solar panels. So it does everything you want. And my house has a 812 pitch roof and the snow does not slide off it. And that might just be due to the generation when my panels were made because they were had aluminum frames on them and sometimes you don't get that anymore. And then they also want you to know that um, so this is just one day here. So I'm generating solar power on my panels. A cloud comes over and you know, you lose all your solar. <laughs> so it goes from 100% down to 5%, back up to 50%, 100%, 50%. So, you know, you need sun 
to generate power on your um, panels and the power curves can be erratic, but it really doesn't hurt you because all of you will probably be um, grid connected and you know the grid is your battery. So if there's no solar from your panels, it's just getting your electricity from the grid at that time. Now this is my favorite part. It's kind of the, the history of solar. So believe it or not, the solar effect was actually noticed in 1873 when they were putting down the transatlantic cable for the telephone system. So you wouldn't want to put a wire into the um, Atlantic Ocean that was no good. So they were testing it before it went off the ship and down to the floor of the ocean. So they had a selenium bar, which was acting as a resistive resonance, a resistive um, resonance, um, well, I keep going. And they found, and this was all in a box. And when they opened the box and sunlight got on the selenium, the system stopped working. And they really couldn't explain that, but they quickly learned that you just keep the box closed and keep on laying the transatlantic cable. So, so they studied this and they found that if you put sunlight on the selenium, you could get a voltage. So the first solar cells were made of copper, selenium, and gold back in 1884. And they actually did build arrays in New York City and tested this. And they were about 0.25% efficient um, at that time. And the greatest minds in the world thought about this for 20 years. And then finally, Albert Einstein postulated that sunlight contained energy and they called it light quanta at that time. And nowadays we call it photons. And um, so I just, let's just go over to a, this little picture over here because we've got Thomas Edison, um, you know, the people who were the Westinghouses and the Teslas and the Thomas Edisons, they were all saying that solar energy was really the way to power the world. So Thomas Edison was quoted saying, I put my money on the sun and solar energy what a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we can tackle that. So that's 1931. And then I like this little chart here because it just shows the way people used to think. So this was actually um, an article that was written by the Department of Energy. And they were, everyone was thinking about atomic bombs in those days. So they kind of rated, rated um, what was equal to an atomic bomb. And they said that the solar energy intercepted by the earth was equal to a hundred billion atomic bombs. So I just thought that was a cute little chart. So back to this over here. Um, in 1953, um, Bell Laboratories was working on transistors. So to get rid of the tubes to the transistors, and when they got done with the transistors, they had an idea of what could they do to make uh, silicon be the new selenium. So they had some chemists go work on that and um, they made their first solar cells and they were about 2.3% efficient versus a quarter percent efficient for the selenium. And so they thought, ah, oh, this is a very good thing. So, and also it's worth noting that um, after World War II, through the beginning of the Eisenhower era, solar energy and nuclear energy were equally funded by the Department of Energy. You know, they didn't know which way they were gonna go. So in 1994, the Atomic Energy Act passed and they created the Adams for Peace program because you know we didn't want to feel so bad about being the only ones who went and blew some up with an atomic bomb. So at that time, the funding for solar was cut and all the money went over to nuclear power plants and nuclear research. So, okay. So that kind of changed the game and it changed it away from solar. Um, so in 
1954, Bell Laboratories introduced the solar battery. And um, just to show how marketing changed, they took a, a rector set Ferris wheel and they powered it with a solar cell, you know, instead of a giant marketing campaign. So that was, so then um, RCA, not to be outdone in 1955, they came up with the atomic battery, which was the same thing and they spent their time bashing Bell Laboratories to keep them from taking over that market. So it really wasn't going anywhere in the beginning of the 50s, um, just because we were putting all our money on nuclear at that time. So, and then the Soviets, you know, they went and launched their satellite and well, you can't be outdone. So we created the Vanguard satellite and we launched the initial ones with batteries in them. So, you know, they worked for about a week or two and then they stopped working. And they did know about the Bell solar battery and, but the military didn't want to use it at that time, but you know, who was going to spend all that money to put up a satellite that only works for a week. So they actually did put like 12, solar cells onto these Vanguard satellites and launched them up there. And some of them are still beeping now. You know, they just never stop working because it's kind of hard to kill a solar cell. And then, um, so it's kind of found its home on the satellites and then sand buoys, you know, you had to power a buoy out in the ocean, you know, so the ships didn't run into the shore but those were all done with batteries. And they said, well, okay, well, let's go put some solar cells on those. So then they didn't have to go and um, go out there and change the batteries so often. And the same thing with, in the desert, they have something called repeaters, you know, just to boost the signal along a long wire. And so they use solar cells to do that because then they didn't have to change the battery. So it kind of found a home. And then in 1973, Exxon came along and said, hey, you know, this is really good. So they kind of funded the first solar powered corporation. And um, I have a solar panel from the 1970s, but I'd have to run over there to get it. So I won't do it. And then, um, so solar, it's, it's found a little niche. And at the same time, well, it has a big niche for solar um, PV, but solar thermal had been kind of doing pretty good at that point until 1974 when the Arab oil embargo ends. And, um, you know, America gets all the gasoline it wants again. And so solar kind of goes by the wayside. And in 1977, the National Renewable Energy Lab was created and Doug and I have both been there. It's a nice tour if you ever get a chance to go. Definitely bring your identity because they won't let you in without that. And then 1979, Three Mile Island has the meltdown and the nuclear industry goes into a tailspin. So now all that money that they were using to um, do nuclear research is now thrown back in the pot for everybody else. And this is just kind of a cute picture over here from the 1920s. And it just shows what people were thinking then because you know they've got the solar farm right here and they're talking about solar cells and they're gonna power everything from the sun, you know, and that was just kind of the way people thought at that time. And they were very into solar. And I got a kick, I was looking at a picture from of one of the old Boeing plants in Washington. And it was probably like 1910-ish and it had solar thermal panels on top of the plants. I couldn't believe it. So, so anyways, so what is a solar cell? Hey, Mark. I, um, a question came into the chat about, um, Stan asks, can you describe how efficiency is calculated? And um, I think we have some, some notes on efficiently a little, efficiency a little later in the presentation. Is that true? Uh, we just talk about how it's increased, but it's um, the solar intensity actually reaching the panel and then how much current is actually coming out the other end. And we always kind of say, you know, it's not the most efficient device, but here you've got something shooting a photon from the sun and it has to hit that panel and knock an electron out into <laughs> space. But um, it's basically the amount of power on the panel receives versus how much power is coming out the, the other end. 
and that's basically in the um, 16 to 22 percent range depending on what you buy Mm -hmm. And if I'm remembering correctly from my solar energy classes, the max, there's like a maximum theoretical efficiency around like 25 ish percent ballpark. Is that so? um, on the space shuttle? They'll get it up to 55 percent. But oh, okay. uh, the taxpayers, you know, they fund everything. So as long as you keep giving them money, they'll keep getting more efficient cells. Yeah. But, you know, for the average, and you're right, there is a slide coming up um, discussing the different technologies. And, you know, what you can get now from your solar installer is minor, like 16% efficient in 2011. You're probably 18%, 22%, depending on what you do. Thanks. Sure. So we have a, a silicon wafer um, that's been treated with arsenic and boron. Um, and so they treat it with arsenic and boron. And if you can see my cursor, there's kind of this line here and they call it the PN junction. And the arsenic um, creates kind of a negative charges and the boron creates positive charges. And um, the way with they, this, they got, we call it a little fence. And if you just leave it alone, the positive charges and the negative charges don't mix. But so if you go and put conductors on them, so these little yellow things here on the top and the bottom, and um, they still don't mix. But if you put it in the sun where the photons come in the hit the um, electrons and they'll knock them into the positive space, then you begin to get a current coming through your wires. So it takes a photon to displace an electron and then the electron goes through the PN junction, which is what we just call the fence. And um, since you've attached connect or, um, conductors to it, it actually goes and collects that current. And so that's that's one cell. So you can't do a whole lot with one cell. So then you take those cells and you connect them to each other. So on my panels, I've got 60 cells per, and it sounds like Sarah and Ethan, they've got larger panels, but you, I was gonna say 72 cells, but they, what'd you say, 120 half cells? Um, yeah, so that was a yes. And so you wire all these together. And so you put 60s together and you get um, a panel. And then you put the panels together and those are all wired together in series. And um, then you get an array. And so typically what most of you would have is probably an array which could produce 240 volts and then the the current changes. It goes up and down with the amount of solar because you probably all have um, optimizers on the back of your panels. So this is what Sarah was talking about. I have got this chart from NREL. And what you buy today from All Energy Solar or the other people is these blue lines and these um, green lines. These purple lines up here, that's that's a space shuttle and things that you can't afford. But the reason I put this in there is why do we got these orange lines? You know, why are we starting all this research here? And it's a it's not that efficient yet, but it's very important. So on those orange lines, that's where you can get to solar windows because you put that as a very thin layer and you can see through it. So what we have is building integrated photovoltaics. And what that means is you've got solar plus a component from the building. So you might have, say, if you go to the Holiday Inn and they got one of those Holly Domes or something and they've got um, you know, a big glass enclosure over the pool, you know, there's no reason that can't be solar. You know, so if you start thinking about that and all those big skyscrapers in New York, 
why not make them solar? You know, put the whole south side of the building, photo um, building integrated photovoltaics. So that's why everyone's working on those orange lines. You know, you you've pretty much got all you're going to get out of the, the green and the blue without another breakthrough. You know, all we're doing now is finding different ways of getting the um, electrons out of the uh, cells, and that's increases the efficiency. But you know, the orange lines that will allow you to find a lot of new places to put solar. Now, here's a YouTube video that if I press this button, the entire presentation will crash. So we won't press it, or should I press it? Okay, we won't press it. So. If we watch that movie, um, we would talk about the three different kinds of solar that you could put on your house. So prior to 2011-ish, the string inverter was the most popular. So that really means that there's no module level, level power electronics on your roof. But then came the microinverter, and I have microinverters on my house, and so um, that allows the different features, and we'll go into that. And now I'd be willing to bet anyone who's putting solar on their house has got power optimizers under their panels. That would be my bet. So let's go just go through the three basic schemes and what's good about them and what's not. So string inverter, I doubt you'll see that anymore. Um, and what it is, is You have a central inverter and you may have three or four central inverters, but if anything happens to any one of these panels in the string, the entire string goes out. So that's kind of a disadvantage. And then you have to make sure that all your panels on your roof are the same thing. Otherwise you just, things go out of balance. So it was the least costly way of doing this. It was, prior to module level um, electronics on your roof. So we don't do that anymore. Um, and the other bad thing about it was if for some reason you had to shut down your system, the sunlight is still creating power all through your roof and down to your inverter where it's finally shut off. So it's kind of a safety issue too. So along came microinverters, and then that followed with power optimizers, which kind of eliminated some of the safety issues. It eliminated losing an entire string due. Honest to God, you wouldn't believe this, but I had, I was looking at my panels on my computer one day and one was out. I was like, what the heck? So I went out and looked at it and a bird pooped on it. <laughs> and that was enough to shut it down, so. Needless to say, I clean the bird poop off. So the microinverter came out and what it does is it's mounted underneath your panel and it's all of these are mounted in series. It produces, so it takes the DC voltage of your panel and turns it into AC at your panel. And um, that uh, then those all get combined. So. And what it'll do is say, if you have a bird poops on one of your panels, it'll do its best to, for that panel, keep it at a maximum efficiency. But um, microinverters are considered to be the most expensive of the solutions, so they don't get used as much anymore. And the nice thing about the microinverters was that if there's a safety issue, it's constantly uh, measuring the um, frequency of the power from the grid. And if your frequency doesn't match that, then it shuts down automatically. And it shuts down at the panel, so you don't have the safety issues of having all these wires energized in your house when there's a safety problem. But I'd be willing to bet that um, all energy solar, which all, a bunch of you seem to have, is using micro, is using, um, optimizers now. So after that came the optimizer. And what it does differently than the microinverter is it's still mounted underneath your panel. But what it does is it 
just maintains a maximum power curve on your roof, but it's producing DC electric. So instead of turning into AC underneath the panel, it stays DC and then you have a simplified central inverter in your house that doesn't do all the functions that the string inverter did. And um, so it gets shut off down at the uh, central inverter. Um, and it's considered a safer solution, a more efficient solution. It's a more modern solution nowadays. And the same thing is it's, you know, it de-energizes the system. So if I suppose if I had to put a new system up, it would be with um, power optimizers. And there's my house there. Um, and the nice thing about the microinverters and the power optimizers is, you know, you can go to your computer and check out how each panel is doing. Um, and the uh, module level um, panel electronics are, like I say, um, more efficient. And I, I even doubt you could, on a residence, even buy a string inverters anymore. On a big solar farm, that's what they'd use because you know you have qualified electricians working on everything, which you wouldn't want the homeowner working on a string inverter. So, say if you were to put panels on your roof, um, you would be putting racking and flashing and clamps on the roof, and you don't expect that. And um, you would have um, grounding features in there, and you have a grounding rod somewhere in your yard. And um, I always say that you get monocrystalline and those are the black ones and, um, and the black frames on them because they look the nicest. And a lot of people, it doesn't matter, you know, what it looks like on your house, but I'm more concerned about your neighbors saying, you know, this is really ugly and saying, I'm never gonna put that on my house. But if you get black frames, black panels, you know, it just looks nice and your neighbors might go and put it on also. And then we have two slides just kind of on what are the components in your system. So you have the PV array, and then from so with assuming you have the optimizers, you'd have DC power coming down to a DC disconnect and that might, that's supposed to be within six foot of a door in your house. So you probably have a little gray box somewhere in your house. So it's, we still got DC, 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 and then we get to the simplified inverter, returns into AC, goes over to the utility company where they have a shutoff too, just for safety. They have, probably have a shutoff on the outside of your house, very close to your meter. And since it's 240 volts, the same thing as your electric dryer, you know, it comes in and it just takes two pins on your main panel, and then it goes out to the meter. So it's either you have power coming in from the, the grid if you don't have any solar, or if you've got too much solar, then it's just going out your meter the other way then to power your neighbor's house. So your power doesn't go far, it just goes as far as the transformer in your yard, probably, or on a pole somewhere. And then here's some pictures of kind of the, uh, what these things look like. So this would be your central inverter and you've got shutoffs, the meters, and the next one. And I always say, here's your enemy. If you got solar, this is your enemy because the, um, the wires underneath your panels are very tasty to a squirrel. You don't want those little guys biting it because, of course, they'll bite the one in the middle. So <laughs> you have a thousand dollar repair bill just getting to it, you know, <laughs> to replace that panel with the the uh, the uh, bit wire. And um, I've never had that happen to me yet, but I do trap about eight squirrels a year and take them to the the park and say, "Here you go, little fella, go run away," because um, I don't want them on my roof. I once had a squirrel on my roof and he had like a little tough and he just looked at me like oh, I'm going to get you buddy <laughs> you know I thought this is a crazy squirrel he must have rabies <laughs> um uh, while we're still on the kind of different parts of the system 
Um, I apologize. Can you stop? <laughs> my dog is is drinking water very loudly in the background of my video. Um, we have a couple questions about um, the house's roof when solar panels are are installed. Are there any additional additional risks to the roof when they're installed, such as like a higher risk of ice dams? Um, and then there's a second question about uh, what does replacing a roof look like if you have solar installed? Can you talk about roofs a little? So yeah, so a house that was built in the 60s has probably got 16 inches on center as far as the truss of the roof um, or the rafters. So you really won't have a problem with strength. But if your house was built before the 60s, you know, your installer, if he's a smart guy, he's going to go and look inside your roof and just see, you know, how your rafters are set up. If they were set up, say, at 24 inches on center, you might say, I don't want solar on my roof because you might start to sag. Um, when I was putting up my panels, the house prior to mine that uh, all energy, not all energy, Blue Horizon was working on, um, it was built in the 50s and they had to go in there and actually put a steel beam in to support the panels underneath the rafter. So there was a little more work to it. So you definitely, if you had a house from the 20s, you know, you probably got really nice wood, um, but you definitely want to have them look at it and make sure, you know, it's strong enough. My panels, when I put them up in 2011, were about 66 pounds each. Um, Nowadays, they're about 45 pounds each. So, you know, they've lightened them up quite a bit and taken quite a bit of material out of them. But if your house was built after the 60s, you definitely need to look. Um, as far as ice dams, I took all those slides out, but um, the panels, the snow, when it starts to slide, it's gonna slide, but it's gonna get to your asphalt roof and it's gonna stop, so it will build up. So in my garage, I actually have a 30 foot snow rake and I do rake them off. Whereas um, on my upper array, which is on the second floor of the house, I can't get to them and they just kind of build up there. But I never really had an ice dam problem because I've got 30 inches of insulation in my attic and I've had it sealed up pretty good. But I don't know, did that kind of answer the question? But it will slide and you will get, um, snow building up between the end of the solar panels and um, the um, edge of the roof just due to the asphalt shingles. I got one too. Um, Mark, my if I can weigh in, um, we have a house that's really prone to ice dams and the areas where our panels are are actually the areas that don't get the ice dams because the panels go um, pretty much the entire length of the roof. It's a story and a half, so there's not a ton of roof space. And we find that it's really nice because the panels actually prevent the ice dams because the snow slides right off and doesn't build up. But that's because they kind of go all the way to the gutter. Um, yeah. If that makes sense, it's it's been really no, that does. such a good question. I, yeah, if, if I had to do it again, I my panels are maybe 18 inches away from the edge of the roof, but I would have them moved all the way to the edge. So it just slid right off and there wasn't that possibility. But that's kind of a learning experience. So your installer was smarter than my installer. Yeah, and then the, there's, I'm gonna weigh in on this other question. Um, yeah, about replacing your roof. I see Stan just typed in again. If we know we will need a new roof within five to eight years, is it better to replace the roof before installing solar? Um, I would say yes. I would say yes. In my experience, so we got a new roof from the hail damage last August, um, if any of you also got in on the hail damage, because we needed a new, new roof anyways. And after the fact, um, our solar installer told us that they won't install solar panels on any roof older than four years old or something like that. So it has to be a pretty new roof. And that might just be the installer that we used. I don't know if other installers have different rules, but um, yeah. yeah. No, I, I definitely, I when I put mine up, I had hail damage too. So I had a new roof put up in 2011. As soon as they were done, then I went and 
put the first array on. Um, and I can imagine that, you know, the, the installer, he's going to get blamed for any leak that goes into your attic. So he'd rather just start with a completely new roof. And if you were going to get a, a roof, you know, in the next, well, I'd say just get the panels after you get the roof. And who knows, maybe by then they'll have um, solar shingles. And there are actually four different brands of solar shingles sold by roofers now. And I would try them, but I'm so happy with my panels. I just keep them. But here's just kind of another picture of um, that shows the different components. So you got the panels and then you got the DC disconnect and the simplified inverter and then the shut off. Um, this one would be for the utility company. And you, um, and then, you know, the 240 volts just goes into your main service panel and taking two pins like your electric dryer would and then out to the meter, which is a bi-directional meter. And so it's just constantly determining, you know, whether power is coming in or going out. And they measure that, you know, once a month, just like normal. So only about 18% of the roofs are favorable for solar, you know, due to trees and facing the wrong direction and all that kind of stuff. So if you want solar and you're an Excel customer, what do you do? So Excel, they are want renewable energy credits. So they are actively looking for people to put solar on their roof. So they have incentives available. The 26% tax credit was extended through 2023. Excel has their solar rewards program and this is for putting solar on your roof. So what they do is um, for anything your panels generate for the first 10 years of being turned on, they'll give you seven cents per kilowatt. And they give that a check to you like once a year in January or February. And then any power that you don't use, they will purchase that back at the retail rate. So, you know, when you get the net power generated, you know, if it's favorable to you, you get money. And if it's not favorable to you, they take money. And, um, the size of your system is capped at 120% of your historic usage. So they go and do a 12 month look back. And I always say use monocrystalline panels. So those are the black ones. And if you got a frame, make sure that um, they anodize it black too. So it's just, you know, it looks like black shoes and black shoelaces. I just saw a new setup that was put up and here they went and used black panels and silver frames. I thought, ah. Oh. Don't do that. <laughs> so I, my uh, son, Scoutmaster, we were always talking on the trail about my solar. And so he put up solar on his house in 2012 and he didn't care what it looked like. So he had polycrystalline, which is the blue panels and silver frames. And they got four panels up. His wife looked at it, said, no. <laughs> so they had to send them all back. And so she came over to my house and looked at it and said, I want those. <laughs> you know? So they waited a couple of months and put on black on black. And um, if you're interested in this, so I would say that um, $3.50 to $4 a watt. And you, Sarah and Lauren can kind of confirm whether that's true or not if you do it by yourself, but you can become part of a buyer's group. And if you're interested in becoming a part of a buyer's group, um, they usually get about 20 houses together. And then you go and look for an installer as a group. So instead of paying $3.50 to $4 a watt, you may pay $2.75 a watt for your panel. So it reduces the price somewhat. So if you're interested, you know, just kind of get a hold of them or yes, and we'll get you signed up with a buyer's group. And you don't have to do anything. It's just, it's just another way to look at it. Then you've got the support of, you know, 20 other households and an organization to help you. And they just pick one installer. And if you don't like that installer, you don't have to use them and you can leave the buyer's group, but it's just another option for rooftop. Um, and one of the questions when we were talking about this ahead was, um, solar gardens. So in order to 
go and increase the amount of solar in the state, the um, legislature back in 2014 authorized solar gardens. And it went through quite a few cycles through 2014, 2016. And it just was decided that a solar garden can be a maximum size of one megawatt, meg. Um, and I put some links in here and Lauren's, she's got the links and Sarah's got the links. So if you're interested, but um, just the Excel program, Solar Rewards Community, and then um, the Clean Energy Resources team has a really nice um, discussion on it also. So say, I, okay, I want solar panels. I want my energy coming from solar. Um, the same thing you're now you're limited to buying up to 120 percent of your annual usage if you were to go to either one of these websites it'll get you to the same spreadsheet that's on the that's excel created of the different solar gardens that are in the state and it'll tell you all about them whether they're under construction or they're completely filled or or what type of garden um, and there's different ones where you know, you um, you have a contract life, you'll describe the reimbursement and there's really, the reimbursement has changed over the years. The newer ones have something called the value of solar. And so you're, instead of being um, compensated at the retail rate, you're compensated maybe three cents more than the retail rate um, due to some legislation. You know, you're, this is a real contract that you're signing. So you will have penalties if you cancel early. Um, and since all of you on this call are probably in Hennepin County, you have to pick a solar garden that's in Hennepin County or an adjacent county. So you guys, if you went to that um, spreadsheet, you look for Hennepin, Ramsey, Dakota, Scott, Carver, right? Anoka and Sherburne counties. And those were where you look for that. Um, and some of the solar gardens, you actually would pay money up front to buy your panels. That's probably not as common now. You probably have a monthly installment fee, but you'll still receive your regular bill from Excel. Um, and your subscription ag agreement will be with the garden operator, not Excel. Excel they're just giving you build credits. The garden operators and builds it, maintains it, determines how much your bill credit is. Um, and with a, you may or may not save money. Um, generally what you'll find is you can expect to pay a couple of cents less than the retail rate from Excel. That's kind of the idea, but there's no guarantee. And on your bill, you'd see something like this. Um, a solar rewards community solar and a credit. So, you know, you have all your charges and then you get some credits. And then I usually don't do this, but the um, state's attorney had a, has a really good publication on that. So Lauren and Sarah also have the, um, the link for that. And it's well worth reading. I was very impressed with what the state did, so because they, they want you to be careful of what you do because you are signing a real contract. Um, and then, so if you don't want to have a solar garden, you can always get um, Renewable Connect through Excel. And what that is, is they'll say that you get 100% renewable energy, 80% of it's from wind, 20% of it's from solar. You buy it in 100 kilowatt blocks and um, Generally, for each block, you'll pay a dollar more per month. They're assuming that you use about 750 kilowatt hours in your house a month. I don't know how they get that, but that's what they get. And so they're saying that you can expect to pay six to eight dollars more per month, you know, with a typical house. Um, and, you know, if, if renewable energy is your thing, you know, you won't mind doing that. And you really only pay for the energy you use. So, you know, that's that's just Excel's estimate because they had to tell you something. Um, currently, there is no utility scale solar available in Minnesota with Excel. They're going to build another garden, but 
they're completely filled up. So it's a popular program. And um, so there's another option and I don't know where it falls here, but um, they've been talking for years that, you know, solar is basically a white middle upper class thing. And, you know, how do you bring disadvantaged populations in there? So in 2013, MRES went and presented a proposal to study how people of lesser economic means can be brought into solar. So we didn't win any money at that time, but in 2014, the, and the Excel said, hey, we want to try your proposal. So, and then finally in 2015, after lots and lots of lawsuits and all that kind of stuff, not just at us, but everyone else where this money was going, uh, we did sign a contract with Excel to have this garden to study how people of lesser economic means would buy solar. And uh, what it meant was that most of your state programs, your energy programs, if you're the low income standard is 80% of the area mean income. So if you are, meet that retire, re requirement or make less than that 80% of the area mean income, you are considered a, a disadvantaged person. So our garden was tailored towards those people. But the first thing we learned was due to HIPAA laws, nobody's gonna tell you who those people are. You know, so it's a secret. So the state knows, the city knows, Excel knows, but nobody will tell you. So what it turned out to be was if you're on any of the, <coughs> the major programs like LIHEAP or WIC or Head Start or Section 8, uh, we just assume that you meet the requirements and no one ever questions it. So, you know, you get people with um, different language backgrounds to go out in the community and sell solar for you. And the contract requirements are rather minimal because the people don't have any money anyways. And if they don't pay their bill after two months, they just get kicked off and you put another person in there in their place. And um, so, what you need is a large, uh, I'd call him an angel who says, you know, if you don't have enough people with lesser economic means to buy the power, we will just buy all your excess power so you can keep your garden going. So here you've got the impact building on um, uh, Lindale. And so, this much of this is our, our solar garden for studying how people of lesser economic means can participate. And the rest of this are for profit gardens behind there. But um, so we're in North Minneapolis and that got put up in 2018. And so the impact owners, they are our large angel who buys our power if you know the people who of lesser economic means don't pay their bills. And then you find large um, anchor customers. So um, ah, try to think who they are, but you see their their housing units all over. Um, Common Bond. So Common Bond is a large anchor customer, and so they'll buy maybe two thirds of the power, and then they the individuals will buy that other third, and then our angel will pick up whatever's left, and so that way people who you know, are not used to contracts, um, can participate in solar. And so the grant in from 2013, 14, 15, whenever you want to call it, is studying, okay, so now we've got a um, urban area and uh, we're starting another garden on the intersection of Highway 56 and Highway 30 in Dodge County next month. And that's good meant to study how well people in rural areas would go and um, use these uh, underserved community solar gardens. So, and then we write a report for Excel and see what happens after that. And then we thought we'd just talk about some fun things with solar real quick. That's really the kind of the end of the presentation, but we have a solar regatta every year. Um, we're hoping to beat the pandemic this year. So in, on May 22nd, if you know of any middle schoolers, high schoolers who'd like to participate, we got some solar panels they can borrow. Um, you just 
if you got a mom or dad with, you know, a canoe and you can put a trolling motor on the back. And the only thing I ask is that if you tip over, that battery cannot come out of the canoe because ah, Hennepin County Water Patrol just does not think that's very funny. And then, um, so we do middle schoolers and high schools, and um, we were just invited today to go to Boulder, Boulder to um, talk about this, to kind of spread the, the word about solar boats at the ACES convention. And then there's an intercollegiate league called the Solar Splash. And it's mostly Southern schools. I've been trying to get the University of Minnesota and University of Wisconsin to join this. And they're hoping to beat the pandemic too, but they seem to be having more pandemic problems than we are. So and they're invited to go to the American Solar Energy Society convention in June also to talk about that. And then of course there's solar cars. I took all the dates out. They're much more popular in the University of Minnesota. You know, they do that every year. They've got lots and lots of cars there. And then um, the big event in the Midwest is the MRE Energy Fair in Custer, Wisconsin. And that's canceled for this year due to the pandemic. We were all surprised about that. And like I say, we're always looking for volunteers for the eco experience at the state fair. But after our first meeting on that, we don't, we normally like 150 volunteer spots. <laughs> It may be a case of there might be seven spots, you know, you open up and then you leave because they don't want a lot of people around there and they're going to try and have the state fair, but it's not a done deal yet. So, and um, that's kind of the end of my presentation. That was awesome. Thank you, Mark. Um, another question came in while you were talking about um, batteries. So would would but the question is, would buying a battery such as the Tesla Powerwall conflict with the program from Excel? And this is from Stan. Stan, I'm assuming you mean the solar rewards program for rooftop solar installation? So you are allowed to put a battery in your system and the um, circuit, it's wired so that you can never discharge it to the grid so you can charge it from your solar, but um, it only discharges into your house. That's the way it is now. But we always wonder, you know, you'd think the electric company wants you to buy all the power or batteries you could possibly get because here, you know, you're the one spending the money. And with the smart grid, you know, they're just going to take it out of your battery anyways when they want it. So, you know, I'd say have everyone buy 10. When I put my solar up, batteries weren't allowed. But, you know, when you guys put yours up, you know, you could have put a battery in there if you wanted to. Uh, but it's a special circuit. And I'm sure, you know, within the next two or three years, that'll all change so that, you know, the, you can discharge it to the grid. Awesome. And then Aaron also asks, what are some good resources when looking at prices for installation? Well, like I say, the general rule of thumb is like $3.50 to $4 a watt if you're not part of a buyer's group. Um, I just get three quotes, you know, and to me, you know, money is important, but you got to trust the person who's putting it up because you know if anything goes wrong you need them to help you um and so i think it's more of a trust issue with your installer if you don't like the person who comes to your door just don't have anything to do with them mark we also mres has a solar site assessment program so you might want to mention that so yeah so if you wanted to check your house out um you can just contact Doug at the phone number on the slide there and um, he'll set us you up and they will go and give you a nice report on your house and what you can expect and the good things and the bad things. And he'll go take a look at your roof just to give you an opinion and might look inside your attic too, <laughs> depending on when he sees your house. But a lot of it's just done from Google Earth, you know, initially, and then you can talk about what you want to do after that. So I say, if you were to call an installer, they're just going to go and look at Google Earth and they'll know a lot about their house before they call you back. Awesome. Um, well, I think, unless I missed something, but I don't think I did. I think that's all the questions that I saw come in through the chat window. I'm just going to give a few seconds to let anyone 
type in some last minute questions. Um, oh, another one just came in. Good. Are there any issues with wind like we've had the past couple days, especially for panels that are set on the roof, not nailed down? Now, you know, we in Minnesota are kind of blessed because the wind generally comes from the west and the north. And you put these on the south. So the crest of your roof is really protecting your panels from the wind. So I think I, in nine years, I've only turned my panels off twice because of large southern winds. And I learned I didn't need to do that. So, you know, they're anchored into your rafters. They're not anchored into your decking on the roof. So if they've done that correctly, you won't have a problem. And I think you'll find also that you can buy panels that are a little lower profile so they won't catch the wind. <coughs> awesome. Yeah, I've, I was always worried about like hail or something like with big storms. Um, but these panels are rated to like really big hail. <laughs> yeah, it's like one and a quarter inch diameter hail. And we actually, so years and years ago, I went and before I put mine up in 2010, I went over to Jan's house to look at her panels and she had um, panels and her roof was completely destroyed by hail maybe five years after she put them up and none of the panels were hurt. Um, so, you know, and I mean, it's just holes through, she had sheets or shingles on her house. That, so they had to take the panels off and, you know, redo the house because the insurance company's gonna want you to do the entire roof. They're not gonna let you do, you know, patch around the panels. And then they had to put the panels back up. But, you know, the second time they go up a lot quicker than the first time. Awesome. Any, any other questions that either Mark or Doug can, can answer for you guys? Feel free to also just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask or type in the chat window and ignore my dog in the background. <laughs> He's being a little bit of a pest right now. Um, if not, guess what? We get to do something fun. Um, Hopefully you all realized when you registered that you have a chance to win a door prize. Um, so we have three different door prizes. Um, and my lovely husband is gonna help me with this. So the first one that we're gonna raffle off to, um, we are just using a handy dandy random number generator. So he has written all your names down and assigned you a number. Um, and the first thing is this handy, I'm gonna open it here, but it's a solar battery charger for your phone. And this was donated by, very generously by MRES, oops, upside down. There we go. So the lucky winner for this is I have the random number generator on my phone. Number 11, Ethan, who is number 11? Who is it? Can you say it all out? Janet, you won. Janet. Woo! Yay. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Oh. So, um, <laughs> so I have it physically. So um, Lauren will just contact you via email to, to get your, your home address privately. And um, we will drop it off for you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, second thing that we have is a, I think this is $25 gift card to Wagner's. Just getting it in its little cubby. Woo! All right, so the lucky winner is number two. Who's number two? Aaron. Aaron. Congrats. $25 to Wagner's. Same deal, physical gift cards. So we'll just get your address privately and drop it off. <laughs> just in time for gardening season. Perfect. And yes. Last but not least, um, there's a, another $25 gift card to, this is the Settergrens, just down the street in Armitage. Um, Settergrens Ace Hardware. So... The lucky winner of the 
ace gift card is number number one. Who's number one? Linda. Linda. Perfect. Awesome. Oh my gosh. Thank you all so much. Um, other green team members, marker, dog, any any closing words? This has been so fun. I, I, I was reading the chat. And so the one gentleman, he doesn't um, clean his panels off. So one year I got tired of my, so I got my lower array on the garage and my upper array on the second floor. And I got tired of having the snow on my um, upper array and not be able to get it off. So <laughs> I went up on the roof, started to clean it off. And here I'm cleaning it off, um, putting on my escape path. So it's like, oh, that was the dumbest thing I ever did and never did it again. I had to kind of slide my butt down my garage to get off. <laughs> I, I have an announcement uh, for people. If they're interested, they are more than welcome to join us on our monthly meetings on the third Thursday of the month. We have a great speaker come in every month, actually for the last 14 years, and we do videotape them. And uh, you're welcome to join us. It's, uh, at this point, it's a Zoom meeting. Uh, when COVID gets done, uh, we'll be back at Mayflower Church, which is pretty close to your community. And, uh, and the connection for that is you can sign up for a newsletter, or actually, if you're interested, we'd love to have you sign up for as a membership to MRES, because we have our, a member organization. But anyway, uh, either through the newsletter that goes out to members, or you can go to the MRES website, which is mnrenewables.org and, and uh, look there and there'll be a link to the Zoom meeting. And so they're the third Thursday of every month at six to 7 p.m. And we have some great speakers. I mean, talking about sustainability issues for the city of Minneapolis. Uh, uh, we actually last year had a guy in uh, actually not too far from your neighborhood, who is the uh, world's largest collector of solar ovens. And he talked about how solar ovens work and uh, showed us some of the ones he had. So anyway, you're, you're very, very welcome to uh, you know join us. And then just to follow up on that comment with the, uh, the solar site assessor, uh, MRES does charge $175 for that service. And we did it because a lot of people asked us to have a neutral party come and look at their roof or their home and you know help decide what could be put up there. And they didn't want to deal with the salesperson right away. And then afterwards, they uh, often you know go out and get three bids. But uh, so anyway, that that solar site assessor, and again, that's available through our website. So. That's that's our commercial for tonight. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much again, Mark and Doug. It has truly been a pleasure collaborating with both of you on this. Um, so I hope you've had fun too. Um, oh, we did, and we I had to laugh that we didn't meet Sarah and Ethan through one of the monthly meetings. So yeah, yeah, we popped into their December meeting. It was really lovely. So. And it happened to be the, the one meeting per year where they like recap all the fun things they did throughout the year. So it was like the perfect meeting to attend. But awesome. Okay, well, I think that that ends it for today. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed my night, so. Thanks so much for doing it. Bye guys. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks for all the great information. Call that phone number if you have any questions. <laughs>